Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 39. The purpose of this podcast is to take high level developer information and projects that are occurring within the space and break them down into bite-sized consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So Rick and myself are the hosts today for the Cardano Effect, and we want to thank everyone for joining us today. If you missed the last episode of the Cardano Effect, we did our live weekly community wrap-up episode. So we take the top post in Reddit, we go to the forum, we go on Twitter, we interact with the audience. And we've been doing it for two weeks now, and we appreciate all the support. We've been getting good feedback, so I think Rick and I are going to make this a weekly thing. Um, I want to... Send the well wishes to Sebastian. Sebastian's on vacation this week, so he's not going to be able to join us. But we have a very special guest today, so we're going to get right into the mix of things. I want to remind everyone that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. Remember, you are your best financial advisor, and if you don't think if you don't think you are, you need to qual- find someone who's qualified to do so. So, with that being said, Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? What's happening? Hey, Philippe, I'm doing well today. Thanks for asking. I appreciate it. And we have Professor Simon Thompson coming on the podcast today. He's, he's our special guest. Before I get on to that, I would like to thank IOHK for sponsoring this podcast. I would also like to remind the viewers the podcast is available on AudioCast, on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and iHeartRadio. So just a reminder on those activities there. We have next coming on is Professor Simon Thompson of the University of Kent and Senior Research Fellow at IOHK. So, Professor, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's All good right. Thank, thank you as well. And I, what are, I will let our viewers know Simon goes by Simon, which we call him Professor out of respect, but he goes by Simon on a regular basis. So, thanks for coming on the, on the podcast, Simon. We very much appreciate it. And uh, what's the main research that you do for IOHK? Okay, so I'm the research lead for Marlowe, which is a financial domain-specific language that sits on top of Plutus. So it's designed for for people who want to write financial contracts, but don't want to get into um, the details of of writing programs in Plutus. So that's that's the aim. Because I think if you look at the the, um, Cardano architecture, there's room for a lot of different languages there. Um, we have Plutus as the as the general purpose language for for programming um, blockchain applications. It would be the the analog of Solidity for um, Ethereum. But what we've done is we wanted to look at writing languages that um, are more specific, are designed for solving particular sorts of problems. And there are lots of advantages in doing that. Um, you design a language that's closer to the applications rather than closer to the blockchain itself. But I can say a bit more about that a bit later on, if you like. Okay, no, I appreciate that because some of the core languages that people often most hear about in Cardano is Haskell, uh, Plutus, and Marla. Those are the yeah. key three different ones. They're not the most popular mainstream languages that people hear about like JavaScript and Java and Solidity mm-hmm. on the blockchain programming. And there's a lot of differences but we, you know, we like to keep it basic at the very beginning. So what, the, what are the key differences between you got Haskell, Plutus, and Marlowe? And Plutus and Marlowe are domain-specific languages, right? Haskell is a, Haskell's a general purpose language, like C++. So it's out there, and people use it for writing all sorts of applications, um, you know, from web-based things to intensive data analytics and so on. So, as I say, it's like C++. I mean, what, what's different about Haskell is it's functional. And I think you've had, you've had other people on the, on the podcast talking about this, perhaps uh, Philip Wadler and Manuel Chakrabarti. Um, people have been thinking about functional languages for the last 30 years or so. And they, they, have, they have advantages in that you write in a very clean, clear, expressive mathematical style. I think one reason they've been coming in um, more recently, one reason they've been getting traction is I think people, when you start writing applications, <clears throat> particularly multi-core applications in traditional languages, you run up against all sorts of problems of contention between threads when you have shared memory. So people have begun to think about what they call immutable data structures. So you don't, you don't program by changing values in variables, you, change, you program by thinking about data and how one piece of data relates to another. And this whole idea of immutability is right there at the basis of, of functional programming. Um, 
The other thing that is is key to functional programming is being able to have behavior as data. Um, and, that, and that sounds really weird, if you like, but what's, what's interesting is those ideas are sneaking into every sort of programming language. Java now has lambdas, JavaScript has lambdas, um, I think C++ might have lambdas. So a lambda is, is the way that you form these functions which become data. So the ideas of functional programming have gradually been spreading into um, traditional languages. And that means that people are looking, they're getting a taste for this in something like um, JavaScript or Java or, or something like Scala. And they're saying, well, we want to do, we want to do this for real. And lots of people are now migrating to language, uh, Haskell particularly as a way of writing general purpose applications. So that's Haskell. Is that, does that make sense? Are you happy with that as a starting point? Yes, it certainly does. And I did, I did a little bit of lookups on, and I went back to it's wiki.haskell.org. Right. You can, you can look that up because often what people will ask is what is Haskell used for? Does anyone else use it? Did you yeah. know, IHK invent this? There is an, a very large number of corporations on wiki.haskell.org that use the Haskell programming languages. Facebook is one of them, Alston Trading, there's banks, AT&T, AT&T yeah. is a very big company. There is an extremely large number of companies. If you want to look up more about that, check out wiki.haskell.org. It's used anywhere functional programming languages are needed. Google, Google is yeah. on the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's a... And there are quite a lot of people are using it and not talking about it, but that's another, you know, another story. So yeah, so Haskell is there. Um, and it's a language which gets people excited. So it's a way, it's one reason for using Haskell, though not the primary one, is that you can recruit some of the top programmers. Because people who are who are get excited by programming get excited by being able to use the best tools. And I think that's one reason that Haskell has come in as a as a tool of choice by OHK. Um, the other thing to say, and I think this underpins you know, IOHK's general philosophy, is that Haskell, because it is more, inverted commas, mathematical, it's the thing, the programs that you write are closer to pieces of mathematics. They're not entirely pieces of mathematics, but they're closer. And so it's easier to write proofs about how they behave. So it's easier, in principle, um, to understand, to analyze the programs that get written, to, to prove properties of them. Um, and this is something that IOHK has wanted to do to build infrastructure that has a high degree of assurance um, built into the, the, the very development mechanism. And I think that's something that Haskell does support. You can take this, for example, um, work that the, the formal methods team have done is to use logic to describe aspects of the blockchain and then turn those into pieces of Haskell code in a way that you can see here's the blockchain code, here's the Haskell code, and they match very closely together. So it's easy to see how you get from the, the full the logical specification to the Haskell. Um, so that's, that's another reason for choosing Haskell. So Haskell's is general purpose language that runs on, on everything. Now, if you like, um, we then move to working on a blockchain platform. And when you, when you move from writing a general purpose program to writing for blockchain, there are constraints on the language that you want to use. Hence, Solidity is a language that's designed to run with um, Ethereum, for example. Because in Haskell, you can write programs that can not terminate. You can write programs that run forever. You can write programs that consume large amounts of resources. And we don't want that to happen in a blockchain environment. Remember, these programs are going to be run by everyone who is running a node in, in Cardano. So people want to be able to write programs that they, where they can understand how many resources they're going to use. Um, they want to make sure that these programs will not run forever. Uh, you want to make sure that the programs won't, won't cause particular kinds of errors or, or exceptions. So you want to write in a different sort of programming language, a slightly more constrained language. You also want the language to reflect what's going on in the blockchain. So it has to be able to be aware of things like um, slots, slot numbers and so on. as an, an abstract notion of, of time passing. So the language has to be different. And so Plutus has been designed as a, um, 
a language for writing general purpose computations in on the blockchain. But the good news is that Plutus isn't an, an entirely new language. Plutus is really a version of Haskell. And so if you understand Haskell, you can write Plutus as long as once you've understood its blockchain, its blockchain context. And that has a huge number of advantages because, for example, you don't have to write new editors. You don't have to write new um, profiling tools necessarily. These things come from the Haskell world. So we can reuse things that they, they, the, the large Haskell community has developed and reuse those for, um, for developing Plutus programs. And that's a, that's a difference from the, the, the Solidity world where when you write Solidity, you write your, your, um, your blockchain application that runs on the chain in Solidity, but then you have to write a whole lot of JavaScript that runs off the chain to make the, the, the whole application work. So you've got something running on the blockchain and then perhaps code for the wallet that, makes the, that, that integrates um, that program, makes it run in a way that users can interact with it. So within that world, you have Solidity plus JavaScript, two different languages. What we have in the, in the Plutus world is it's Haskell producing both sides of that. Um, so what runs on, on chain, what runs off chain, those are both Haskell code. So it it's provides a single view of writing an application rather than these two views that have to be then integrated. Okay, but it's, so what we've got is this very nice version of a general purpose language that runs right for which you can write general purpose programs on blockchain but the disadvantage of that is you've got to be a programmer so you know, the story is uh, there's there's a nice story about um what's the most uh, widely used functional programming language in the world do you know the answer to this it's excel it's the spreadsheet uh. language, right so the world is there are 10 times as many users of, of spreadsheets as there are of general purpose programming languages. And what people do when they write um, spreadsheets is what they're really doing, if they're writing formulas and so on, they're writing things in a general, per, in, a, in a particular domain. So you can see Excel or the way that people use Excel as providing what's called a domain specific language. You know, if you're working on a, a financial application in Excel, you'll be using um, financial terminology and so on. And what we've done with, with Marlowe is to say, well, what's the smallest language we can devise that is going to be allow people to write financial contracts like, like a simple loan um, and run that on the Cardano blockchain? And we were inspired to do that by work that had been done nearly 20 years ago now in the financial sector of saying, let's see how we can describe financial contracts in a way that's unambiguous and um, executable. And this was work done by Simon Peyton Jones, among others, around the year 2000. And a number of, a, a number of investment, um, investment banks and so on use this as, as standard technology. So what we thought, was let's take those ideas and see how we have to modify them if we're to run those contracts on blockchain and write contracts that are, that are in a way self-enforceable. Because one of the differences about between running things on blockchain in this permissionless, um, borderless world is that there aren't, there aren't the legal backups that there would be for an ordinary contract. Do so you think you sign a contract um, for a mortgage or a loan or whatever, and that that the the that contract is underpinned by the legal system in the US or the UK or wherever. So if you don't pay, your counterparty can sue you. Um, but if you if you want to to do a similar thing on blockchain, you have to find mechanisms. And it's, perhaps we can can't always do that, but in lots of cases we can think about how to do that so that we can enforce the the terms of the contract. On the blockchain and what we wanted to do was was look at how we had to modify those contracts in order to um to try and achieve that so that's what we've done with marlow and what we're certainly what we're trying to do is to write to produce a language which is usable you know, like excel it's usable by a whole group of people who wouldn't want to write haskell programs um so simon jumping on that example real quick i just have a quick question so sure. 
you were comparing this to Excel. So yeah. is the model team going to have to continuously update based on the needs of those that are using the financial contracts saying that they like, for example, if they need a new formula for their particular contract would the model team continuously need to update the code in order to suit those business needs? That's, that's a good question. I mean, we, and I think there are two answers to that. Um, the first is that I don't think Marlowe is going to be the only domain specific language that will run on Cardano. I mean, we, you, can, you can see that we're, we've scoped it in a particular way. We don't necessarily want it to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. What, what I think IOHK, and I, I would certainly support this, what IOHK would think of doing is to build another domain specific language to work in a, in a different area. So we don't have to just have one, one DSL. I mean, the whole point about them is that you will have different DSLs to work in different domains. But that being said, you're quite right that we should be thinking about ensuring that, um, that Cardano can be extensible, uh, that, that Marlowe can be extensible. And there are, there are two ways in which we're, we're addressing that question. The first is that we are talking to the, the group Actus, which is a, um, an independent foundation which is has built a standard for financial contracts and you can find it's actusfrf.org if you want to look them up on the internet they have um they have a taxonomy of the different kinds of contracts that uh, are are typically found you know some of them some of them there will be some very exotic contracts that ta taxonomy doesn't cover but in general um what they've done is they've found a way of describing all the different classes of contracts, financial contracts there are. And what we've been doing is talking to them about how we can, ensuring that we can cover, if not the whole of their standard, the, the, the um, vast majority of their standard using the constructs in Marlowe. So we've got this external, um, this external check, if you like, on, on the scope of what we're doing. But the other thing to say, and this is important, and I, this isn't, contradicting what I said earlier. Um, Marlowe is, is, it's not a standalone language. So Marlowe sits inside Haskell. So what you can do, it's what's called an embedded domain specific language. So you can write inside Marlowe, but if you want to pull in something from Haskell to help you write a contract, you can do that. So that you can gradually extend what, what Marlowe does by pulling in little bits, little, small features from Haskell. And then using those, we can generate perhaps a more, a more low level, a, more, a bigger Marlowe, con a pure Marlowe contract. So we're able to use Haskell to describe more complicated constructions and then turn those into Marlowe. And so somebody who wants something that isn't, isn't provided directly by the language can just dip their toe into the water, just, just using a small amount of Haskell to extend it in that way. So what we, we hope we're doing is we're getting that extensibility through embedding. Um, and it's, it's quite nice to have that gradual approach. You're not, we're not saying, okay, you've got to, you either use Marlowe or you've got to throw Marlowe away and use the whole of Haskell. You can extend it in this gradual way. So that's what having an, what's called an embedded domain specific language does. That's one of its real advantages. So that's something that we, we expect people will do. You can, for example, write a short abbreviation for something in Haskell, or you can write a template for a whole collection of, of um, contracts using Haskell. So that allows us the, that um, extensibility. Okay. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Rick, were you gonna say something? Oh, yes. I, I also had, I was wondering along the lines of Plutus and for the up and coming software developers out there and the software developers that are coming over to Cardano from other blockchain projects, like what resources are available? The most recent one I've seen was um, from Lars Brunez and Polina Vinogravata. Of, they wrote a book, uh, the Plutus ebook. Yes. Okay. Yep. So there's an ebook available. And in one of your previous videos, you, you spoke of mock chain. I can't remember exactly how it worked out, but there's something like a mock chain for developers to practice on. Is that how that works? Yeah. Let me let me talk through what the various resources are. So yeah. So I, the key thing is um, you know, we, we're 
Plutus and Marlow are being developed to, to be deployed on, um, on the Cardano blockchain. And so, and the plan is to have that done in the next, certainly within the next year. Um, in the meantime, what we have is a, a simulation of what the blockchain is like and Plutus and Marlow run on that. But in terms of people using Plutus and Marlow now, what we have are what are called the Plutus Playground and the Marlow Playground. So those are web-based resources where you can develop Plutus contracts, you can develop Marlow contracts, and then you can interact with them, you can simulate them. So you can get an understanding of how your contract behaves without, um, without running it on the, without deploying it and running it. And we see that, I mean, that means that people can get started with, with using Plutus and Marlow now, but it's something we expect people will do even when Plutus and Marlow are deployed. You know, you want to play around, you want to validate this, this contract that you've written. What you can do is run it in the playground and get a good sense of how it behaves before you start putting it out um, for live use. Because of course, once it's, once it's running, you can't stop it. You know, it, it's once you've 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 written your Marlow contract and it's deployed to the block the the blockchain, it will run, it will run its course. And if it doesn't do what you wanted it to do, then you know that's unfortunate. But you know, that's life. You've signed the contract. Yes. You, know, you can't you can't you can't change it when it's running. I mean, maybe you could in 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 the real world, but you can't on the blockchain world. Once it's running, it's running. Full stop. Um, so providing people with that sort of um, that sort of facility is something that's very important. Now, what we're doing is we're in the process of doing some revisions for Marlow. And if you look on the, uh, our main resources are on the GitHub, um, the IOHK GitHub, we have Marlow 1.3, which was our original version of Marlow. And what we're doing is we're for the Wyoming um, Financial Hackathon, which is in mid-September, we'll be releasing an, an integrated version of Marlow where we have the Marlow playground and the, um, and the code and a tutorial all together in one place. Where we are at the moment is we have separately the Marlow playground, which we used to call Meadow and a tutorial on GitHub. We're, we're moving towards in the next few weeks, having those all in an integrated format. Um, now, one of the advantages of Marlow being a, a domain specific language, and this is something else I was going to come back to, but it's now's a good place to do it, is that when you write in a, a domain specific language, because you don't, you're not, your programs can't cover everything, they just they, in this in this well delimited area, you can do more with them. You can, by reading a program, you can look at any point and say, oh, I know what inputs it's going to take at this point. So it means that you can simulate the program much more in a much more high fidelity way than you would simulate a general purpose Plutus program. So somebody can get a very good idea that at this point in the contract, they're only going to be offered this option or this option, for example. It's much easier to read the program and simulate it on the basis of that. Um, so that's another advantage of the DSL because it is because we re re we've restricted what it can do. It's easier to understand how those programs behave. And it also means that we can write programs to analyze contracts. So we can say, we can check that whatever you do, however somebody interacts with this contract, it's not going to produce a failed payment, for example. And that's the sort of analysis you'd like to know before you deploy your contract in practice. So being able to do that sort of analysis is something else that we'll be putting into, or we'll be integrating with the Marlow playground. So it will allow you to have that sort of that sort of reassurance when you um, when you write your contract. Okay. Now, just one other thing: <laughs> there is a there's a Udemy course about Marlow, um, and there's a Udemy course about Plutus, and those are in the process of being updated. But if you want to find out about the principles underlying Marlow and so on, that's a good place to go. So Udemy has those courses, and you know quite a lot of people have done those already. Um, we'll be updating those with the, the team who, with Neve and, and Alejandro, who helped us make those. Uh, again, we're doing that over the next few weeks. So there's a lot of work going on, just pulling together some, some, some changes we wanted to make and integrating everything into this, um, into the Marlow um, and Plutus playgrounds. 
So that's that's the and with a, with a view to having all this ready for um, for mid September. But certainly the the uh, resources are out there. And as you said at the beginning, there's now the the ebook. And the nice thing about an ebook and and about um, online tutorials, we can keep those up to date as um, as language as Plutus and Marlowe evolve. So there'll be a, a, a resource that will always be up to date with the with the current version. But that ebook is there; it's freely available. So if you, you can buy it on Amazon, but you can also um, uh, get it through other other sources. Um, and I guess we can put a link up to that on the on the podcast. Yes, yes. I, I took the Marlow course on Udemy, and I've never written code in my life, and I was able to successfully create an escrow contract using Meadow, and it was relatively easy. So I wanted to ask you a question about your target audience for Marlowe. Yeah. Um, Haskell is a very in-depth language. It requires sure. years of experience. And if you have a small or medium enterprise, you have to hire a Haskell developer in order to build your solutions for your particular company. Or you have to hire someone who's, <laughs> who's going to give you that assurance that they're going to build something correctly. Is the purpose of Marlowe to circumnavigate that? And would that decrease the costs for businesses trying to implement smart contracts? I think it's a way in. And I think what we're, we're saying is there's a, um, you know, if individuals or small enterprises want to build contracts in this in this financial domain, then what we're doing is providing you a way in. But, but I suspect as you grow, you will want to customize things. And at that point, you'll be thinking about writing in Plutus. So I think at that point, you'll probably want some Haskell expertise. But what we hope to do is provide people a smooth way in um, to understanding. You know, it may be that this is the way in. They start writing Marlowe. And then they can see the value in, in transitioning to Plutus and at that point make the investment. Um, okay. But we're hoping there's, there's less of a step, I think. If you go in, you start off at the Marlowe level, and then maybe you think, OK, Marlowe isn't giving me quite what I want. But it, now's the time for me to make that, make that switch. Okay. So it's a smoother curve, I think. It's a smoother, smoother way into adoption. OK. Um, but also, as I said earlier, I think, I think it's on IOHK's um, in, in IHK's plans to look at DSLs in other areas. I mean, you can imagine you might want to write one for online games, for example. You might want to write one for um, uh, supply chain management. Um, these are the sorts of things that people are talking about writing on blockchain. You know, lots of being able to track assets, for example, across the supply chain could be a, it could be a hugely, um, hugely valuable application area. I think this is something that you know it's not IOHK aren't the only people speculating that that's an area to 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 think about. I don't think that's anything anything new. But you can imagine that, that one way of helping people to get started in that area is to say, well, look, here's a here's a small DSL that you can use to get started. You know, maybe you'll want to tailor things eventually and and um, turn that into something like a, a full blown Plutus uh, application. But to get started, you can think of doing some supply chain stuff in this way. So that's, that's, I think that's how we'd, we'd, we'd see the, we don't expect people to necessarily to stick with Marlowe forever, but to, it's a, it's a good starting point. Okay. Just as, um, you know, you did your first, you got your introduction using Meadow, which we're now calling the Marlowe Playground. Um, but you, you will find if you want to start writing bigger contracts, you'll probably transition into writing them as, as text rather than using blocks, for example, you know, cause you can imagine the block, what, what, um, what Meadow does is it allows you to write Marlowe contracts by plugging together pieces like pieces in a jigsaw. And that's a very nice model when it all fits on the screen. But when, if you're writing something that's much bigger than fits on a single screen, it's probably, you're probably better moving to text. But that's you know, like a formula in Excel. It's not, the text is not, is not, so, um, is, is not so difficult to understand. But I think we see Meadow as a very good starting point there. Okay. Okay. Um, I had a question about um, if you're not familiar with uh, Simon's paper, Marlowe Financial Contracts and Blockchain, you give a use case example of escrow. And sure. I always wanted to pick someone's brain at IOHK when they speak of escrow. When you're speaking of escrow, is it on the big scale? Is this like real estate contracts or is this small consumer to consumer, like purchasing something on eBay, a small escrow can transaction via PayPal, or is this something more on a large scale handling with 
larger amount of money? Or is this, is this for both use cases? I'm not sure if my question is making sense, but. Um, I mean, I think, I think the principles are the same, whether it's large or small. Okay. That, um, that, that what you're doing is your, and this is something that people have done. People have written escrow contracts on, on, on Bitcoin as well as, um, as well as more advanced blockchain platforms. I mean, they, what's nice about, I think the reason we use, or the reason I use an escrow contract is it's something you can write on a single screen. So it's something where you can get the essence of what's going on in a very small space. So it's a very nice example, a pedagogical example for getting the ideas across. But I guess, you know, I think in principle, you can see these things being used both by individuals and by, um, by larger enterprises. I mean, I, I, and, and lots of, you know, IOHK, Cardano are not the only blockchain platforms that are looking at, at, at these sorts of, of applications. I mean, I, perhaps IOHK is, is unusual in looking at financial contracts that run on a permissionless, you know, on a public blockchain, as it were. The other, other enterprises are looking more at private, private blockchains where there might be, where there is a, a source of authority in, in terms of a bank or whatever. Um, whereas I think you know, we've been looking at things in terms of, of permissionless applications, so running you know, without that without that central authority. Um, so that's one difference. But I think, I mean, predicting what business, what blockchain-based businesses are going to be like in five or ten years' time is a, it's not a business I'd want to get into. You know, I think it's trying to predict the future is always tricky. There'll be something, something will come out of left field that will be the, you know, a killer application. That's often the, um, so migrating, migrating existing things, I'm sure we will see financial um, transactions moving onto blockchain, but it, predicting what the, you know, where the, where the um, real money will be made, I have, it's very difficult to know. I understand, I understand. I hope that, I hope that answers your question in a, yes. in a roundabout way, at least. Yes, uh, it does. Yes, it does. Good. Rick, um, I had a couple more questions before um, maybe we can hit the Reddit soon. Um, if you had any questions, I, I didn't want I to. Did, okay. I, I did have a few for, for the sake of the viewers and people who are new to the podcast. I wanted to circle back around to um, Haskell for a moment. Sure. Because people often hear two, a couple of terms used with Haskell and other programming languages at large, and that is called Turing Complete. And mm -hmm. also that Haskell is a lazy something language. Right. And so, first of all, can you tell us what does Turing complete mean? And I know I've watched uh, the Enigma with right with uh, Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. Yes. Yeah. And that's the same Turing, right? It's the same Turing. So Alan Turing. Alan Turing, who in and fact is my mathematical grandfather, because my PhD supervisor was supervised by Alan Turing. So that's a you know, it's surprising how, how things can decline in two generations, but anyway. So what Turing did was this remarkable thing in, in sort of late 1930s that he did, a, before there were computers, he did this analysis of what, what a computer could do in general. Um, and he, and, and, in, and what he meant by a computer then was a human doing it, because computers in the, in the 30s were people who did, who did calculations on paper or using calculation machines. And he said, well, what, what is it that a, a computer, a person or a machine does when they're computing? And he, he talked about it in terms of writing things in books and, and doing certain, certain sorts of actions. Um, and then that, that got formalized in what's called a Turing machine, which is a very, very simple idealized machine where you have a tape on which you can write, you can write symbols on the on the spaces in the tape, and there's a read. The tape can move left and right under the reading head, and it has a finite number of states. So you know, it's like we, if you want to model a human, you might say that we're either sleeping or eating or working or relaxing, something like that. This this machine has these different states, and depending on its state and the symbol it reads, it does something like moving the tape or writing something else. And what's extraordinary about that incredibly simple model is that Turing and, and people around the same time, Church and Gödel and so on, saw that this was, this did embody what a, a, an idealized computer could do. And so 
uh, you would call the language Turing complete when it can do everything that any other general purpose language can do. Um, and so that's, that's the idea. Now, not, you, can't, you can't compute everything. So one of the things that Turing, um, Turing discovered is that, for example, I, I won't go into technical details, you can't write a computer program that will tell you if a computer program you give it is going to terminate. When I say terminate, you know, it's finally going to give you an answer. It won't just sit there spinning forever. You can't write a computer program that will do that. And he proved that in a very nice way using what's called a diagonalization argument. And so there's this notion of what a, a general purpose programming language can do. But as I say, because of, because of Turing's argument about um, not being able to, to show a program terminates, there will be some programs that you don't know whether they're going to terminate or not. So a, a Turing complete language is one where, and I think I said this earlier on, it's possible you might run a program and it will run forever. You can't predict in advance, in general, whether a program is going to run forever or it's going to stop. And you certainly don't want that happening on blockchain. So that's why people typically write programs in a more restricted language. Something like Solidity is not Turing complete in a fairly ad hoc way. You, can, you restrict what you can write in order to, to, so that you know your programs are going to terminate. What we're wanting to do with Plutus and with Marlowe is the language is, and certainly Marlowe is not Turing complete. There's lots of things you can't write using Marlowe. But the nice thing about that is that there are, um, we can then predict for any Marlowe program, how long it's going to be until basically it's completed. We can do that. Whereas with a general purpose programming language, you couldn't. Um, so you get advantages from not being Turing complete. So by restricting what you can do in your language, it means you can say more things about all the programs in the language. And that's very helpful. Um, is that, does that make sense? Yes, that makes yeah. sense. And does that also lead us lead into, what does it mean by lazy, lazy evaluators? Okay. I mean, in, in a funny way, laziness is not so, um, it's not, is, more, is a more technical issue. So um, it's not so fundamental. Um, how could I, how should I talk about laziness? What laziness says is when you're, when you're running a computer program, um, you, there are parts of the program that you, you can't predict in advance you're going to need. And so you do things on demand. So for example, um, if I, suppose I have a program that can, um, I give you a number, if that number is even, I do this thing. If the number is odd, I do that thing. So if I give you the number three, I know I'm going to do this program. If I give you the number four, I'm going to do this program. So what you would like your language to do is to only evaluate this and this program when you know it's actually needed. And what laziness does is in many cases, it says, okay, I'm going to delay. I'm going to look at this number. Okay, it's number two. I'm going to evaluate that program. It's number three. I'm going to evaluate that. Whereas other languages, more traditional languages will say, I look at the number, I evaluate, I evaluate this. Oh, that number's two, so I need to use, the, use this uh, program. But in fact, this bit that I didn't need, I in fact computed. And so what laziness does is it, it, it delays evaluation of some things so that you only evaluate something when you need it. Now, so you think, well, that's good. You know, procrastination is always a good thing. You're only doing what you need to do. It does have some downsides as well. So um, you might, let me try and think about this. In particular, when people talk about laziness, I think one of the, the more difficult things about laziness is when computers, when a computer program runs, it uses some, some of the storage of the computer to, to, store, to store the things it's working on. So it has this working space, if you like. And 
when you write a program in a traditional language, it's easier to predict how big the working space is going to be. When you write it in a lazy language, because you're delaying things, you say, no, I don't want to do that yet. I'm just going to store it. I might need it later. If I need it later, I'll, I'll evaluate it. But I'll just store it. I'll just put it in my attic, put it in my basement, and I'll only pull it out um, when I need it, if I need it. And then you have this potential problem that you store a lot of stuff. You need a bigger basement, you need a bigger attic than you would need if you just worked it out as you went along. So there's a place where this can, can become tricky is, this, uh, is how much storage. So predicting storage usage is more complicated in a lazy context. So you, you're delaying things, but that delaying things can have the side effect or, or can have the effect of making it more difficult to um, to to predict how much storage you need so that's i think that would be the that's the trade-off if you like there um you're perhaps saving time by not doing the thing you didn't need but you're perhaps wasting space by storing it away um un, unused if you like maybe just evaluating it would have been easier so i hope that yeah that, that that's that, that's the trade-off there i think but in a way it doesn't hugely affect how you write the program there are some things you can do with laziness that you couldn't do with, with strictness. And some people are very strong advocates of that. I think I'm less, you know, my, my feeling is it's, it's not, it, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice feature. It's very useful in some contexts, but I don't think in general it makes a, it, it makes a huge difference um, to, to the sorts of programs you would write. There are other, there are other functional programming languages um, like OCaml, um, which people use. There's a, a, a functional language inside F sharp. Um, so, and those are what are called strict. So they're not lazy. I think, I think where Haskell is different and where perhaps the, the thing that you, you, we should stress more strongly about Haskell is that it's pure. So I, I talked earlier on about immutable data structures. Um, in Haskell, everything is pure unless you um, you explicitly label it as being um, something that has a side effect, something that, that does some input or, or input output or stores some values separately for you. Um, and so it's entirely pure, whereas other languages are more, have taken a more pragmatic view like OCaml. It's a functional language, but you can also do things which are impure. Um, and so you, you, you don't have complete immutability in something like OCaml. And that, that's a feature which I think people people are seeing as, as, as a crucial thing, a crucial design decision about Haskell. So its purity, I think, is more important than its laziness. Um, okay, so it depends on what you need. It depends on what you need, but, but um, yeah, it swings and roundabouts. Some things are easier with laziness, some things are more difficult. Um, but, but sure as heck, having a pure language means that, so, so that every side effect, everything that isn't pure is, is explicitly shown. You can explicitly see when, when, when a function you write is, is potentially has, has a side effect, changes the state of the blockchain or whatever, that's, that's very easy to tell in Haskell. In other languages, that's not. And I think that's a, that's a huge difference. It means that you can write code, which is, um, it's easier to validate, it's easier to verify because of this, this, this purity. It's closer. I mean, the language of mathematics is 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 all, all about immutability. Um, so it's closer to math if you if you make things pure. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's Simon. Great. You gave an you gave an example of filling up a room. So, what are the size limitations for Marlowe or Plutus when writing smart contracts? If we're thinking about future use cases, and Charles has brought up land registry, and we're putting mm. on the blockchain. That's going to take up space. And as things become more and more complex, these documents or information that has to be stored within the blockchain are going to take up space. So are there limitations and what could be used in order to circumnavigate those? Well, OK, that's a that's a big question. Um, and I think there are a number of answers to that. Uh, I mean, the Cardano blockchain it uses what's called a UTXO model. So it uses an unspent transaction model rather than something like Ethereum, which uses accounts. So in that sense, it's a much more parsimonious model. Um, 
So the, the actual footprint of a contract running on, on the Cardano blockchain is smaller than the footprint of a, a contract running on Ethereum because of this, because it's running on this, uh, albeit extended, but a UTXO model like Bitcoin rather than an account-based model like Ethereum. Obviously, and one of the things that comes out of, 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 um, of the design of Plutus and, and of Marlowe is that we're able to predict usage of, um, we're able to predict, predict how long it will take for a contract or a particular stage of a contract to run, how many steps will, we, will be taken there, and therefore have a model of cost. I think there are, and there are things which we have not resolved in this area, which I think myself are important. Um, so one of the things that happens in when people write ordinary computer programs, there are often libraries which they can use to help them. So if I'm writing a program, I typically don't write start from scratch, writing everything for myself. I'll use some libraries that the language designers have produced or somebody else has produced, and it's out there on the, on the internet. So typically, programmers try and reuse other people's work, reuse libraries as much as they can. Now, we need to think about how that works on blockchain. We need to think about, you know, are we going to provide templates for contracts, for example, that people can reuse just by filling in some different parameters? You know, there's a, we maybe have living on, on the blockchain a library for a zero coupon bond in which you have to fill in the size of the bond, the length of the loan or whatever. But you can reuse that, you can reuse that contract template again and again. Um, and maybe we should be incentivizing that rather than saying to people, um, as it were, copy everything and, um, and run that, that copied contract. We perhaps want to incentivize people reusing it for two reasons. One is that we can, we can save on storage space. And the second is we can be sure that if we have this, this contract, this library contract, as it were, sitting on the blockchain, and people reuse it, they're reusing the same thing. So if, if somebody says, I'm using that standard contract, that makes more, that gives me more assurance than if they say, oh, I've made this contract, is this copy of a standard contract, here it is, let's use that. So actually using the library. So finding ways that we might incentivize that, I think is a is a question that we're we're actively talking about, and will be you know, when when we deploy these things in practice. That will be um, that will be a question we'll have to resolve. I think the final thing I would say, and I think this is, um, I'm sure you've had discussions about this, or if you haven't, it would be good for you to do this, is that there's a notion of a the, the people in blockchain lab in Edinburgh particularly have been concentrating on of a side chain. So you have the, the you have this spine, as it were, of the of the Cardano blockchain, where you settle, we effectively do financial settlements. But on a blockchain on a side chain, which is another blockchain which is tied to the to the main chain, that can be a place where you do more complicated calculations. You know, might do you might do this really complicated calculation, fill your attic, fill your, your cellar. But in the end, the only thing you're interested in is at the end of the contract, it says, give him this amount of money, give her this amount of money, and give me back this. And that's what you put back onto the main chain. So you can do more expensive, you know, more, more, more sophisticated, more exotic things on the side chain, and then peg them back to the, to the main chain. And that's certainly a, and that's a model for, for extensibility, I think, that you can do more complex stuff. And you keep the main chain for doing simple, um, simple uh, settlement of, of um, Transactions, indeed, it, it's you know, we've called it. It's been called the settlement layer of Cardano. Um, yeah, there's, there's that, multiple layers. Yeah. And, so, and if viewers want to see more information on that, there's a really good video by Dionysius Zendros on sidechains on the yeah. IOHK YouTube channel. So check out IOHK YouTube channel. You get more information. Like, yeah. Uh, deeper dive on sidechains. So I didn't interrupt, Professor. You were saying no, no, no. I think, but that's yeah, that's great. But I think you know, one thing that we can do is this: it, it's it can potentially solve that problem of of um, space consumption, time consumption. Sure, that sounds good. 
Rick, we have a couple of Reddit questions that I want to get to before our hour is up. So do you want to run through those? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt you if you had any previous questions before we go to Reddit. No, Professor, it's been fascinating, um, yes. all the information. Oh. Well, then I hope it's been comprehensible. You know, to let me... Yeah, you can find me on Twitter and you know, if you want to, to engage a bit more. Good, cool. and get Thank more information. I read your Twitter, I, I read your Twitter page too about very uh, practicality of Haskell or something that was on your Twitter header. Okay. okay. Practical cool. use versus academic. Okay. All right. So for the for the Reddit questions. Yes. I've got to pull that back up. I've got it right here. There's 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 two. Yes. And they're very relevant to everything we've been talking about. Yes. And we'll start with, I'll start with the Tony from Shoshone. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay. So Tony from Shoshone. Thank you, Tony. Frequent flyer on the Cardano Effect channel. Uh, he says, I would like to congratulate your team on the work completed so far on Marlowe. I understand and appreciate the benefits of domain-specific languages for reducing errors and entry level and creating smart contracts. So totally in line with everything we've talked about so far. As a technology coordinator instructor for a small K through 12 Wyoming school district, I was wondering your thoughts on using Marlowe Playground with its Blockly language for teaching computer science in public schools. Do you think Marlowe could be used effectively to introduce students to Haskell and functional programming? Golly, that's an interesting question. Um, thank you very much, Tony. That's, that's, a, that's a good one. So would it be Marlowe or Plutus well, to introduce them? Well, it, what you have in the, in the Marlowe playground, you can write, you can write little bits of Haskell around um, around Marlowe contracts, so you can see how those uh, how those um, how those Marlowe contracts get it, how the Haskell description turns into a piece of pure Marlowe. Um, I, I I guess I have two I have two doubts. Um, the first is that it would be teach be trying to teach Haskell or trying to teach functional ideas using um, this fi financial domain, and I'm just not sure how much that's a domain that makes sense to um, K through 12 students. Um, it might make more sense, we did some work in an earlier version of Marlowe, looking at describing simple games like rock, paper, scissors using, using a DSL. So I think it might be that, and we've, we've talked about building a general game DSL that would sit on top of, of Cardano. So I suspect that could be a better, and games have been proved, have been, I think they've been shown to work well with children. So it could well be that, that move, moving to a, a, something like Marlowe, but in the game space would be a better way of, of, of getting across ideas from Haskell. The other thing I'd say, and this has been, it's always, it's tricky to use visual programming alone. I think Blockly works well when you're, when you're, you're putting together um, things like these Marlowe contracts. It fits well with the shape of the, of the programs. If, you, if you're wanting to write Haskell programs that have complicated expressions inside them, you know, even something as simple as A plus B plus C, you don't want to start writing expressions like that using blocks. So I think in teaching, in teaching functional programming, there is, a, there is an emphasis on expressions. And so there's a bit of a tension between the expression level and the, and the visual, I think. And I think that's something um, that would need more attention. But it's so much easier to write A plus B plus C than it is to have a block for plus and then a C there and then a block for for plus again and a, an A and a B. Um, so I think, I think there is a tension there, but I'd be really interested if you had any, any thoughts or any, any um, feedback on doing this in practice. I think that would, be, that would be fascinating. I know that there's been work by um, a colleague, Manuel Chakravarti, on some work on, on um, visual approaches to, to teaching Haskell. 
in using a sort of playground approach um, for he has um, he was involved with developing an app for the Mac that uh, that gives you facilities for doing some visual um, visual rendering of Haskell programs at least and programs to manipulate visual things. So that that could be another way in. Um, so I think there are there are there are fascinating things to do here, but I'm not sure that that Meadow or the Marlow Playground are exactly the right thing for K through 12. But thanks for the question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Appreciate it. Great question, Tony. So we, the second question is also from Tony and uh, Tony from Shoshone. Once again, thank you. He, he asks always great questions on the, on the, on the mm -hmm. program. So we appreciate him. And he asked for projects such as Cardano, what would be the typical difference in job duties between a Haskell developer and a functional compilers engineer? Oh, okay. Um, I guess the, the compilers engineer is going to need to know a bit more about how compilers are built. Now that could be, you know, if you've been through a computer science degree, computer science major, you might well have learned, done a course on compiler construction. So you might not, I mean, it's, it used, if you'd done a course 20 years ago, you were definitely done a compilers course. Now it's not always the case. Not everybody teaches compilers. So you would have understood, you'd understand the principles of, of, of how compilers are built, um, what some, of the, some of the tools you would be expected to use. So you'd have that general understanding. I think the other, the other difference is that you might well need to know quite a bit about um, some of the technologies around Haskell. So understanding what goes on in parts of GHC or using um, what, what's going on, for example, in Cardano is using template Haskell. So um, understanding that, using Haskell to write um, parts of a compiler, perhaps integrating that with template Haskell. So understanding compilation in general, but also understanding some of the stuff, the compilation infrastructure that there is around Haskell. So I think that would be the, that would be a, a, um, a particular difference there. Uh, so, for example, the people who are working on the Marlow team have Haskell expertise, but we're not typically looking inside GHC. Um, what we're doing is is um, is using using Haskell, using Plutus, because uh, one thing I didn't talk about was one of the nice things about how Marlow and Plutus fit together is that the way Marlow runs is that there is a single Plutus program which runs all Marlow contracts. It's what's called a, an interpreter for Marlow written in Plutus. Um, we're also looking at, at alternatives, so we might compile Marlow directly into Plutus, uh, but at the moment what we're doing is, is, is that interpretation. So we're using some compiler ideas, but not certainly not getting inside the details of GHC or the, the, the Haskell infrastructure in general. So I think that's a good, that would give you a good summary, I think. Okay, thank you, Simon. That concludes okay. our Reddit questions. Um, we're gonna just ask you a couple more questions. One is, um, how did you get involved with the Cardano project? I mean, you are an academic and usually the academics kind of frown upon cryptocurrency in general. What about this blockchain project really attracted you to, to, to work with IOHK? Well, I think talking to Charles, because Charles, when, when, when IOHK was set up, Charles reached out to a number of people and, he and I had a conversation, which it, it took a while to, to work out how we might work together. But, but building a DSL in this area seemed like a, a it seemed like such a good, such a good way of, of, of understanding what was going on in blockchain. Um, I mean, I think academics, I, think, I suppose it's, I don't know, the phrase we would use in, in Britain is it's like Marmite. People either, either love it or hate it. Marmite's this thing you spread on toast. Um, but if you, you know, look it up on the internet, you'll, you, but I, I think for me, what, what's fascinating is that there are ideas about programming, building programming languages. You have to think differently in the blockchain context. And that's, that's fascinating. You have to think about, you have to think about the crypto aspects. You have to think about running on a different sort of platform, this blockchain, which is distributed. Um, so, designing languages becomes becomes a different thing. So for me, there's a real challenge there. And also the way the different fields fit together um, is, uh, I think, very exciting. Um, so yeah, I think there are lots of interesting problems. So there are quite a lot of academics who are who are moving into blockchain. You can see IOHK has, has 
uh, people with an academic background involved, particularly uh, Professor Phil Wadler, uh, but also people who've who've come through as doing PhDs in computer science to get been attracted to this. Um, so I think, yeah, I got in through through Charles reaching out, but but seeing this particular how. I think seeing how the, the ideas you have and the technologies you have actually apply in a particular area for me is fascinating. You know, that's something that really gets me excited. So I'm very pleased to be working with, with IOHK on this. And, and what's your, what's your long-term vision for Cardano? Like, let's say five years out, five, 10 years out, what do you think this project can accomplish? Um, what do you think this space is going to move towards? I mean, I think Cardano can, can accomplish getting it right, you know, doing it, there's when you look at I, I don't want to be critical of, of of other other projects that are going on at the moment but something like ethereum there would you feel that things were decisions were made which i think designers would perhaps regret when they come to revisit it i hope with cardano um, using proof of stake using formal methods it's going to build a chain that's going to be sustainable you know just in terms of energy consumption um and that will be providing all sorts of services to all, all sorts of different people. Um, so that would be my, you know, I, I think it has the opportunity to be sustainable, viable in, in a way that other things, other things are not. So that would be my, but, but, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to know. It's, it's that all sorts of questions can come in. Um, you know, as you said at the beginning, it, it's, um, it's very difficult to predict how things are going to be. Technologies can can succeed, can fail as well as succeed, just like stocks can go up and down. And, and yeah, technology, if you look at the history of technology adoption, it's unfortunately not always the best, it's not always the case that the best technology wins. It's the one that finds the, finds the right niche. Um, but I think what, what's certain is there's a huge amount of, of developer effort and academic effort and intellectual effort going into Cardano, but also into other, other systems as well, um, which are, <clears throat> so you know, as a space, it's, it's remarkable how much effort is going into this. So some very good things are going to come out of it. I think both from Cardano, Cardano and more broadly. So I'm, I'm very positive about it. That sounds good. Sounds good. Rick, did you have any closing questions or do you want me to wrap it up? I had no other questions. I'm just simply fascinated and it was a pleasure to meet you, Simon. Thanks well, thank you very much for the invitation. Good. Simon, thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks to all the viewers of the Cardano Effect podcast. Leave your comments below. And remember, if you're not subscribed to the Cardano Effect, please consider subscribing. Send us messages. We're on Twitter. We're on uh, Reddit. We are on Telegram. We're always open to having new guests. And we had Simon Thompson um, join us today, which is a pleasure. Simon, did you have any last words for the viewers of the Cardano Effect? No, thanks for watching. And, and you know, it's going to be an interesting few years, I think, in the cryptocurrency space and blockchain in general. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And until the next episode of the Cardano Effect. Bye, everyone. Bye.